and a memorial service for Rubina Golden. And this will be on uh, February the 12th at, at 2 o'clock. So let's come and uh, remember Rubina. And also we have Art of Prices um, memorial service on February 27th, and that's at 3, uh, 3 p.m. Uh, offering today is, uh, is uh, for a local church budget. There will be no um, Bible study this afternoon uh, at 2.30 since the pastor's not here. So, pastor, if you're online, take care of your wife, Shaila. Shaila, you get better. <laughs> okay. Um, and then we will also continue the prayer, prayer group at 6 o'clock Monday morning. Uh, that prayer group I've attended several times. And you know how the disciples had flames on their head, you know, from the Holy Spirit <laughs> being in their presence? It's sort of like that, except there's no flame on the head, right? But you can feel, you can feel the Holy Spirit's presence there. So if you want to feel that, please come. I know it's early. It's still dark. Yeah, it's 6 o'clock Monday morning. Um, but I invite you to that. I want to mention the women's retreat, which will be from April uh, 28th to May the 1st at uh, Mountain Springs Lodge, Leavenworth. That's Christmas town, right? <laughs> anyway, a beautiful town, a wonderful time. I, I know that the women uh, will will really enjoy themselves up there. And uh, I'm going to miss my wife for a few days, but I know that uh, she'll be having a nice time with the ladies. So please get your RSVP in. It's, it's critical because they have to know the, you know, the count, you know. And this is by February the 5th. So all women, yeah? I want to invite you to that. Okay. Uh, praise the group. Take it away. Will everybody please stand? <clears throat> Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Please be 
be seated. All right, good morning. Happy Sabbath. We're going to, uh, in your bulletin, it says the feature at this time, but we're not going to be having that today, so we're just going to go ahead and jump right to the scripture reading. Those of you who would like to pull out your Bibles and, and read with me from Mark chapter 5, verses 25 through 34. So it reads, and I'm reading from the NIV version. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was indeed or was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you. His disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Amen. We have a theme. It's all about Jesus today. So, ready? Lift up the trumpet and loud let it ring. Jesus is coming again. Cheer up, ye pilgrims, be joyful and sing. Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Echo at hilltops, proclaim it, ye plains, Jesus is coming again. Coming in glory, the Lamb that was slain, Jesus is coming again. Coming again, coming again, Jesus is coming again. Heavings of earth tell the vast thundering throng, Jesus is coming again. Tempests and whirlwinds, the anthem prolong, Jesus is coming again. coming again nations are angry by this we do know Jesus is coming again knowledge increases men run to and fro Jesus is coming again coming again coming again Jesus is coming God in prayer. Have we 
If the children will get ready to come up and grab the basket things in the back. And if you all want to sing with us, I think you know this song. We're going to do the first verse only. Give me oil in my lamp, keep me burning. Give me oil in my lamp, I pray. Give me oil in my lamp. Till the break of day. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King of Kings. Sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna, sing, Hosanna to the King. It's like a verse. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bird call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, bird call. Okay, help. Yeah, please have a seat. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. How are you this morning? Good? I'm glad. I'm glad. Now, <clears throat> I don't know if any, if any of you were at my um, um, story last time. Do you remember what I talked about last time? Yeah? Good. Well, I talked about last time um, uh, how God put in our body a soldier to fight germs, right? 
right? That's right. I hope you remember. So God put in our body a soldier to fight germs and viruses and all kinds of stuff that comes into our body to make us, makes us sick, right? So, and then, and then what we can do to strengthen our soldiers are um, to, so that we take vitamin C. Vitamin C fortifies, power up our soldiers. And then what else? What uh, weakens our, you know, soldiers? Do you remember what weakens our soldiers? Sugar, that's right. Glad you remember. Yes, sugar weakens our um, immune system or the soldiers. Why? Because the sugar and the vitamin C, they are very alike. So our soldier, by you know, mistakenly taking sugar into their body, and then that weakens. So, okay, anyway, so that's what we talked about last time. So, oh, I have to go back. But anyway, anyway, so vitamin C power up the soldiers, and then um, the soldiers are now ready to go fight, right? And, but you know what? This is today's talk. Um, uh, even though, see, uh, uh, the US, US has a strong military, right? Like, you know, they are ready to fight with all the gears. You know, you do not want to, if you are enemy, you do not want to, you know, meet up with these guys, right? They are, look scary. They are ready to fight. They are strong. And you do not want to be enemy, right? So, um, but you know what? If those, even though they are fired up and powered up and with all the gears, but if they stay in one place, will there be any good? No, they have to be where the enemy is, right? Right, that's where vitamin D comes in. Vitamin D works like, you know, in our body, all, uh, it's like, like uh, always is like, like a reconnaissance. Um, the, the soldiers who are sent out throughout the body to find out where our enemy is. And then when they find where the enemy is, they call for a backup. You know, uh, this is where the enemy is. Please, you know, come back and call for a backup. But where there is no vitamin D or the D is, you know, lacking because then, then the soldier will not be able to move efficiently. So, because they connect to the other backups via vitamin D. Vitamin D plays a very important role. So, vitamin D mobilizes the... Sorry, I'm not good. Here. Go to the next slide, please. Oop. Oop. Um, yeah, Sabai, can you help me? Okay, so vitamin mobilizes the, vitamin D mobilizes the soldiers. So when, when, um, when they call for the backup through vitamin D and the soldiers are sent to where the, um, uh, the, the germs and viruses are and then they fight. Um, so, my question is, how do we get vitamin? Next slide, please. How do we get vitamins? Anybody knows? Yep. Oh, yes, that's right. Pardon me? With fruits. Yes. What else? Eating vitamins. <laughs> that's, yeah, that is right. I, I took my vitamins this day, too. What else? Vitamin. Oh, thank you so much, Alfie. That is so correct. But you know, how many of you are so thankful that we had sunshine last week? Yeah, didn't we? Yes, I was so happy to see sun you know, for a while. You know, this is the only nutrients that we can, you know, get or we make ourselves. When we go out in the sun and expose our skin, do you know what happens? Next slide, please. Our skin start making vitamin D. You know, all the plants are able to, you know, getting the vit you know, expose them 
the plants are, you know, they get the sun and then they, they make all kinds of nutrients. Can we do that? We go to out in the sun and then we will fill, our tummy is filled? No, right? No, we can't. We have to eat. But vitamin D is the nutrients that we can, you know, make within our body. Unfortunately, though, like you said, because we live so up north, our sun is not enough, so we need to take vitamin D supplement. But vitamin D is very important. So, you know, we have uh, very important lessons that we need to, there's a spiritual lesson that we can learn from here. Um, in the Bible, it says, the sun of righteousness shall arise with the healing in his ray or in his wing. So, who is the sun in the Bible? Jesus. Thank you very much. Yes, Jesus is our son, the righteousness. So when we, next slide please. When we receive a next, when we, next please. When we receive the son, when we, you know, when we expose our, ourselves to Jesus, when we behold, when we look to Jesus, Jesus will give us uh, his healing power. And he will close us with his righteousness. And we are ready to meet our enemy, Satan. Right? Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for providing all the wonderful nutrients that we can uh, take from the food so that we can stay strong. And, but most of all, thank you very much for sending your son that we... Um, that we, uh, that you gave us the power to overcome evil, sin, Satan, and heal us from the disease. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we get into the Garden of Prayer, I forgot to mention with the announcements about the Connect card. It's uh, the yellow cards that are, that are in front of you. And uh, especially if you're a visitor, we want to get to know you more. So go ahead and fill it out. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, we like to, we like to get to know you more. Uh, but also to the members too, uh, there is a part in the back of the card of the prayer and praise request. So feel free to fill that out. Or if you have any questions, uh, uh, if you need the uh, advice of, or, or explanation of, of, um, of, of a, something in the Bible or you just have a problem, you need to talk to one of our elders or the pastor, please feel free and you can fill this out. We'll be uh, collecting these with the offering at the end of the service. Okay, with the Garden of Prayer, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the prayer request uh, mentioned here. I won't mention it during the prayer, but I'd like to go over these right now, uh, these concerns. Um, need to remember Rabina's family in their loss. Need to remember Arda Price's family in their loss. Uh, these have been recent, and uh, also uh, Kauri's neighbors um, have just lost a son, um, just in his 20s, and uh, very, very sad, and we pray for, for the neighbors, her neighbor's family. Um, also, I want to mention um, people that we should pray for that have lost, one, uh, lost loved ones during the past year or two. And uh, I want to mention Bryce, and Guy, and Debbie, uh, Joy and Pearl, and Darren, Russ, and so many others that, you know, it, it, it could not 
be just only um, two years, one year, one year or two years. It could be years that you've lost your loved one and it hurt so much yet. Sorry. <laughs> Strikes home, yeah. Um, but, you know, I was thinking, it's so great that we can uh, live with the Lord eternally. And um, as I live longer, I, 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 I experience more life and uh, more joys and that I do want to share with my mom and dad. I got lots to, I lots to um, say to my uncle and auntie, you know, and uh, wonderful things that we can, we can really look forward to. And uh, we, we can read in Revelation 22, the river of life, so meet me there. Yeah, let's all meet there. Huh? For God to love the world. Okay, I'll have uh, Butch. You know, I didn't expect Butch to be here. <laughs> Come up, brother. Tell us about what's happening. Huh? We love you. Well, I had asked if I could just take a minute of time to explain what happened to me, where I am, and what's uh, the prayers that I'm very grateful and thankful for. I have what they call ITP. It's idiothrombonic something, and I don't know the rest of it. Just remember ITP. 25 days ago, as normal as I have ever been, as I was standing here today, I have not felt any pain at all. I have literally had zero pain with this whole thing, right? But I was at home, and I had worked that Friday, and went home, came to church, and on Sunday morning, which is very unusual for me, I, I told Jackie, I said, "Hun, I said, I, I'm, I'm not, I feel, uh, I, I'm really tired. I'm just going to lay down for a little bit. Give me an hour, and then I'll get up and do what I'm supposed to do. So I laid down, and Isaac, some of you have met Isaac, he called Dr. Fletcher, and he explained to what was happening to me, and then Dr. Fletcher called Jackie, and she says, you get that man up and take him straight to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I checked in, and I'm in the emergency room in there and everything, and as I checked in, uh, the doctor takes my blood, take, comes, leaves, and then comes back. And she told me that I had won the award, and I'm going like, oh man, I won an award, I got an award, I didn't even know I was trying to win one. She said, you are the only person that has walked into this hospital with the lowest plate count we have ever seen. I'm going, oh my goodness. I wait, they say to me, I said, well, in my mind, okay, that's, that's okay. I, what, I, what I would like to do next is, okay, I'll get up. Now we know what the problem is. I'm going to go home, right? I'm, gonna get, I'm just going to go home and we're going to fix the problem. And the doctor said to me, yeah, you're going to go home. Your room is, you've been admitted, your room is ready, she said. And they took me up to the ICU department, ICU, put me like basically in a bubble wrap. And they were so concerned because the bleeding, what happens when you lose the platelets in your blood, you begin to bleed out on the inside. And you bleed between your veins and your skin. You never bleed out anywhere else. So you don't feel any pain, but what happens is, is the, the last thing that happens, your heart quits because it doesn't have any blood to pump. And so I'm at the lowest point there. Then she says, the other thing that happens here is, is that your brain will hemorrhage. And at that point, we can't do anything for you. So I'm like going, oh my goodness, this is amazing. I, I didn't even think, I mean, in my mind, I'm thinking I don't have any problem because I'm not associating any pain with what I'm going through. So that day, the next doctor, the general practitioner that came onto the ICU unit, he comes up to me and he's standing next to my bed and he says to me, I want you to know you win the award. And I'm going to myself, won the award? What are you talking about? Because I already knew what she said. And he says, I have never, ever seen this low of a platelet count. And so with that, you have to recognize that all of your prayers are being answered. I'm not out of the woods yet. I have just in the last three days started to actually accumulate platelets in my blood. Okay? I started out on Tuesday with 6,000. 
Now, the average human being has 150 to 450,000 platelets in their system every day. They die off about eight to nine days, but you, that's what you have to maintain what you are, right? I had under one. I grew to 6,000 this last week. Then I grew to 17,000, and yesterday I had 46,000. So you have to praise God for those kind of things. And let me tell you, I, I was out for one day. I go to the doctor, and they took me back into Auburn General. The steroids that they gave me gave me pancreatitis. And so for four or five days, I don't remember, Jackie could tell you she was there with me, but for four or five days, I said, just bring me more. That's all I care about. Just give me more because it hurts. It is the most excruciating pain I have ever went through in my life. So if you think you're getting pancreatitis, my, my recommendation is you go straight to the doctor, get a pain shot as quickly as you can, and get one every two hours till it stops giving you pain. Okay? So I just wanted to be able to explain to you a little bit. We're not out of the woods yet. I don't go back in until Tuesday again. If it has trended up again, Praise God. If not, they have to do quite a different, quite different things. But I am praising God every day that I am out of the hospital. The devil is working hard, ladies and gentlemen. He's working diligently to keep people from associating themselves together. And I was saddened, saddened in a hospital where nobody came to visit anybody. And these people are dying for just want of somebody caring about them. Not just the nurses and the doctors, but somebody that could actually be there and see them and talk to them and encourage them. I'm fortunate. My, uh, Jackie came every day. I, my kids came. I have family. In fact, the doctors and the nurses says, you have a beautiful family. And I'm thinking to myself, it's the only ones you're seeing. So pray for me. Continue to pray for me. And that God's glory and his goodness and his mercies can be glorified, praised, and honored. Thank you. Thank you, Butch, for sharing. And we will surely continue praying for you. Um, as we go on with our garden of prayer, I want you to continue to remember um, Laura, uh, Laurie Sims' cousin's wife, Kim and um, the six-year-old granddaughter, right. Um, also, in the car was also um, uh, Kim's daughter, but she didn't get hurt too much. But the other two, they, ha they have been undergoing um, extensive surgery. And uh, I heard they were getting better. Is that right, Lori? And uh, praise God, stable. You wanna hear that word, stable. Yeah, so praise God. Continue praying for the family. Um, and we have a prayer request for Kathy. And let me read this. Please pray for Kathy, Joy and Pearl's sister-in-law's sister, who is in the hospital with pneumonia and not expected to live. Pray for her family. That pneumonia uh, disease is, wow, you could... You could, you know, there's some medications that, um, medications just don't respond to pneumonia. And you could die in like three days, you know. So you think it's just bronchitis or something, you know, but devastating. So let's continue to pray for Kathy. Um, I hope I don't forget anybody. But also, I'm glad Butch is here. Um, and we think of Jerry Lewis. He has an autoimmune disease. Uh, doctors really don't know how to really help him. Uh, Jerry's been out. Uh, we haven't seen him for a while. So, Jerry, if you're on line, we're praying for you. Also, um, I want to mention um, Lori Knoll, and I think her back is better. Uh, you know, she couldn't feel her legs for a little while, <laughs> and that's, um, that's scary, but she's better. I want to continue to remember uh, Dennis and, and Pam, 
in their, um, in their uh, Dennis has heart problem, like me. <laughs> Many people have heart problems. I, I feel kind of comfortable in this church because, the, you know, um, we've had Robin also that has heart problem. And, um, and Jay, you want to remember, you know. So I'm not alone. But thank you for praying for, for all, all your brothers and sisters. And um, thank you for praying for me. You know, it really helped. Um, I, I, I really am so grateful to you that I'm, at least I, I can open my eyes every morning and thank God for another day. Uh, one, remember Shirley. Shirley's going in for uh, a scan on Monday and uh, hope everything scans right and that she will be free of disease. So Shirley, thank you for um, playing the piano. We wanted to continue playing the piano for years. <laughs> Great. Okay, and then also for Shirley's friend, Kim Moyer. Please pray for her. And also for my classmate in Hawaii, Keith. Uh, you know, he, he had a, a spinal, spinal infection. And uh, that's serious. And he told me, I just called him up last week. He said he's been, he was in the hospital 17 days. And he's so tired of the food. But... Um, you know, I, I'm so thankful. I was in the hospital only for one day, <laughs> as I told them. But anyway, uh, these are prayer requests. Um, as, as I say, I hope I didn't forget anybody, but the Lord is good. The Lord is good. He's there for us. So I invite you to, um, uh, for the Garden of Prayer right now, you can kneel, you can sit, but join me as we pray right now. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your holy name. This is your house, your home. We, wel we welcome you today. Thank you for bringing us together, the church family. Please, with those, please with, be with those who cannot be here today. And give them a wonderful Sabbath day blessing. May your Holy Spirit inspire us as we worship you in words and in song. Be with Pastor Dave today as he, as he shares the message that you've given him. Thank you for your unfailing love, for your mercy and grace that you bless us each day. We praise you for caring for all of our prayer requests this morning as mentioned. Thank you so much for being with each person and in each circumstance. Father, we rest in your many promises that you hold us in your arms, ever covering us with your love. Sometimes we don't understand why things happen. Forgive us for our unbelief and shortcomings. Continue to help us to be faithful to you and to be loving and kind being forgiving and respectful to our brothers and sisters. Thank you for Pastor Mike and Shyla. Um, and Shyla's sick today, and uh, we pray for um, her healing. And thank you for, for their coming to this church. And uh, as they lead us, uh, Lord, help us, to, uh, help us to support them and they are trying to lift us closer to Jesus. And you know, they have a special need to help our young people. I pray that um, they will find a way to uplift our young people to you because they feel our young people is, is so much the blood of our church. Also, Lord, thank you for being in our church plans, our visioning and renovations that will take place in the next few years. We know that you will surely bless us more than we can even imagine, Lord. Thank you. Praise and honor to you, dear, dear God, for sending your son to die for us and that he is risen and that we have the opportunity to live through eternity with, with you and with our loved ones free from disease, 
sickness and injury. Have your way in our walk with you, in the decisions we make and the choices we face each day. For thine is the honor and glory forever and ever. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're so glad to have Nancy Culver here today. And, uh, you know, I was joking with Nancy a few, uh, a few months ago. I told her, you know, every time I hear her sing, she sounds like the nun on, on um, you know, Sound of Music, singing, <laughs> climb every mountain. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Well, good morning, everyone. Sorry for the interruption from my, <laughs> my whistle there. <laughs> In fact, that was, I'd never used it before, so I didn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> I praise the Lord because, you know, I pray whenever I am, have an invitation to sing, I pray the Lord will give me the right song for those who are going to be listening. And after I've heard all the prayer requests and, and uh, Butch sharing his story, I think the song that is based on the 23rd Psalm will fit in quite nicely. It's entitled, The Shepherd. Patiently he watches me and oversees my way, attending me unendingly. The shepherd is always right beside, he's there to guide to green and cooling shade. He bids me come and follow him wherever he may lead. The shepherd is here. The shepherd is near. Picking me up in strong arms quieting my alarms urgently he calls to me if I have gone astray seeking me persistently the shepherd is always rescues me so willingly through danger unafraid tenderly he cares for me and leads me home again yea though i walk through the darkest valley and hear the night winds moan. Though I can't see his face, I can feel his hands. I am not alone. Bird is here. The shepherd is near. Picking me up in his strong arms quieting my alarms the shepherd is here the shepherd is near picking me up again taking me home with him forever and ever his own Hey, 
patiently he watches me and oversees my Thanks for the music. Appreciate that very much. It's good to worship with you today. And uh, I don't mind stepping in at the last minute when there's a need like that. And it's always good to come and join all of you uh, here in Enumclaw. So you're, you're, you're close by. I live at camp, so it's, it's easy to make the trip down. Um, speaking of camp, I've been out on the road uh, for the last several weeks and for several more weeks to come hiring staff for our, our summer camp program. Hard to believe we're already at that time of year. Um, for me, summer starts in January when I begin to, to hire staff. So if you know of someone 17 to, or 18 to 22 that uh, is passionate about young people, passionate about uh, sharing Jesus with children, uh, there is a great place to work not far from here. We'd love to, to see you there. Uh, so have them get in touch with us. We can set up an interview and and, and make that happen. Um, we're excited this summer is, is, um, is going to happen this year. Last year we were wondering and waiting and hoping the state would open, but uh, we, uh, we don't have to worry about that this year, and, and we're running a full summer camp program. So we hope that you will uh, send your kids and send your neighbor's kids, and it would be, it'd be great to, to share together uh, this summer. Um, let's take a moment to pray and ask God to be with us as we worship. Lord, thank you for your word. We invite your presence now to um, fill our hearts and our minds, to still the, the, the rushing thoughts and stress of the week, uh, and allow us to hear your voice uh, in these next few moments. So thank you, Lord, for stepping in in front of me and speaking through me today. In your name I pray, amen. Speaking of camp, that's where we're going to begin uh, a girl by the name of Kate came to camp many years ago. She was one of our horsemanship campers. She came during teen camp, and Kate would have just blended right in with, with all the crowd. She did. You wouldn't have known anything different or strange about her. She was just loving camp and, and loving life from everything that I could see. On that final Sabbath together, we were taking the horsemanship campers up to Chinook Pass. We were going to do the, 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 the hike up there. And uh, so we, we got multiple cars together. And my wife and I used our van. And we had three or four girls, including Kate, pile in and all the way up to, to Chinook Pass. They were just talking and laughing and sharing all the great memories from the week and, and all the stories coming out. And they were just having a great time. And all the way around that hike, the Natchez Loop, uh, they, they were talking and laughing and just having a great time. Kate seemed to be full of life and, and loving every moment of it. As the, the hike concluded, we came back to the parking lot. Uh, the, several other girls that were in our van said, hey, we're going to go with some different people. They've got room. And, and said, come on, Kate, you can come with us. And Kate said, no, I, I want to go with, with Pastor Dave and his wife. And so we piled in the car, and it was just... Myself, my wife, and Kate, the only three of us in, in the vehicle. And we shut the doors. We pulled out of that, that parking lot. Have you ever been at that parking lot up by Tipsy Lake? Pulled out, headed back down the mountain. And she was sitting in those, those middle seats in our, in our van. And she leaned forward between the two front seats. And this is what she said. Do you want to know what my life is really like? It's like, Yeah. I'd love to know. And I thought we'd hear some great stories of all the wonderful things of her life. And she began to talk about her slow slide into depression. And she said, I've watched all my friends start to pull away. And I don't, I don't know why, I, you know, but uh, my life is just a mess. And my, my, nothing wrong at home necessarily, but, but my life just seems to be falling apart. And, and then she talked about all the, the, the negative behaviors that came in association with uh, what she was feeling. And she talked about 
how she had attempted, over the last year, attempted twice to take her own life. Never would have known. Never would have guessed by looking on the outside. Of course, in that moment, um, you, you, you start to, to just have to go through all the, the, the questions and the concerns that you have for her safety. We, we asked all those questions and did all those things. And, and in trying to figure out whether she had any support network, I said, is there anybody that knows what's going on? Have you, have you told anybody? Are your, are your parents aware of what's happening? And again, she leaned forward and said, you're the only person who knows who I really am. Well, we, we got her in touch with help. We made sure that she didn't leave camp uh, without having someone to help her. But those words still haunt me. You're the only person who knows who I really am. Because I think all of us at a time or two in our lives have thought that in our heads. Is there anyone who really knows who I am? Does anybody see inside of me and see what I'm going through and see the pain that, that I live with and deal with? Does anybody know who I am? We don't like to, to, to admit it. We don't like to, to, to talk about it. We, we want to put on a good face and, and play a good game. But we all live out of a, a certain level of brokenness, whether we like it or not. You know, it's been an interesting journey being a, a camp director over the last several years as we've lost a year of camp and struggled with, to get business and wondered if you're going to survive. Uh, last year, as we wrestled with whether or not we're going to be able to have camp again. I was working with a group of camps throughout Washington State known as the Washington Camp Coalition. And they did a survey and a study of all the camps in the state and said, what will happen if you don't have camp? 50% of the camps across Washington State said, if we can't operate in 2021, we're going to close. And I wondered why I sometimes uh, would lie in bed at night. You know, I wondered why my mind would race. And I was on a call with a, a counselor, and they were ha we had a, a webinar with all the camp directors uh, throughout the country in, in Christian camping. And she said, you have to recognize that we have all been through trauma. Oh, we've all been through something, and this has an effect on our life. It's, it's not just the last two years. All of us go through things in our lives that, that wound us, that break us, that, that cause trauma. And we find ourselves asking that same question that Kate asked. Is anybody that knows? And then we wonder, how, how do I live my life out of this brokenness? How do I, how do I be the person that God wants me to be when, when I feel so broken and so alone and so isolated? How do I lead out of my brokenness? Shouldn't I have to get better first? Shouldn't I have everything okay in my life and, and then maybe God can use me? I want to go back to that story that we read just a few moments ago. This woman. Uh, it, the story actually starts a few verses back and Jesus is walking into town and you can imagine the streets crowded with people swarming around him and, and Jairus is the first person to, to approach him. And speaking of, of, of trauma and crisis, this man, his, his life was, was collapsing around him because his daughter was on, his, on her deathbed. You've got to come, he said to Jesus. You, you, you've got to to, to come and, and, and heal her. And Jesus picks them up and says, don't worry, it's okay. And they begin to make their way through the crowd. And, and you, you can see Jairus now dragging Jesus and, and waving his hands trying to clear the crowd because literally the life of his daughter is hanging in the balance. He's got to get Jesus to his daughter before she dies. And that's when the woman shows up. She makes her way through the crowd, hoping not to be seen. As we read a moment ago, 12 years of pain, 12 years of sickness, 12 years of doctors that did nothing but take her money and leave her worse off. 
12 years because of the nature of, of what she had, this, this issue of blood, 12 years of being ritually unclean, not being able to go to the synagogue, not having people be able to touch her or interact with her. This woman was broken, broken for 12 years. And, and she forms in her mind this idea that if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. Now that, that didn't just come out of nowhere. But in the children's story today, we reference that verse with the Son of Man rising with healing in his wings. The other way to translate that verse is healings in the tassels of his garment. This woman recognized who Jesus was. She recognized in him the Messiah and knew that if she could just touch the hem of his garment, there was healing to be found. And so she makes her way. She positions herself where she can strategically reach out to touch him and, and still slink away because she's been abused so many times by the people who she's gone to for help that she doesn't want to be hurt again. So she's, she wants to be able to make a quick exit and no one know. She reaches out and she touches him. And instantly she knows. She knows that she's been healed. And, and she, she shrinks back in the crowd now, particularly because Jesus says and stops and says, who touched me? And, and she says, oh no, I'm going to be found out. They're going to they're know. They're going to be angry. And, and so she starts to slink away in the crowd. But Jesus stops. Somebody touched me. And of course, nobody understands why are you asking such a ridiculous question. But Jesus knows what happened. And he stops and he looks until this woman, who now is, is afraid, comes to Jesus and falls at his feet. She expects the harsh response. She expects angry words, but that's not what she gets. Jesus bends down, I can imagine, and looks her in the eye. And uh, she sees something in him that she's never seen in anyone else. And Mark says that, it's some version to say that she tells him the whole story. Twelve years of pain. 12 years of brokenness, 12 years of isolation and loneliness and abuse. That story doesn't get told in a, in, a, in a few sentences. That's a story that takes time. It's a story that comes with a lot of tears. And so in that moment, I can imagine Jesus sitting with this woman on the curb along that busy street with Jairus tugging at his sleeve. But he stops and he listens for as long as it takes for the story to be told. And when it's all done, I can imagine that he reaches out and wipes the tears from her eyes. And he uses the, this word that, that's very endearing. He says, my, my, my dearest daughter, your faith has made you whole. Faith has healed you. Now, we don't grasp the significance of those words unless we dig just a little bit deeper. When this woman sat in, in, in her house wondering what to do and she thought about this moment that she might have with Jesus, she said, if I could just reach out and touch the hem of his garment, I could be made whole. I could be Sozo, that's the Greek word that's used. I could be saved, that's the, the, the heart of the word, but it's also to, to be made whole. It involves healing, but it involves a lot more. She says, I need to be made whole. And so she comes to Jesus, she reaches out, and she touches him, but Mark says that she doesn't get what she's asked for. She's only cured. And, and the word there is, is laomai. So she receives the physical healing, but she's not been made whole. You want to know why Jesus went looking for this woman? Because he recognized that she needed something more. She needed to hear 
from him. She needed to have that moment with him. And so Jesus stops everything, makes Jairus, Jairus wait, and sits in the curb, and he hears the whole story. And he turns to her and says, My dearest daughter, your faith has, and he uses the word she's been waiting to hear, your faith has sozoed you. Your faith has made you whole. In that moment, she receives what she wants. The difference between her curing touch and the woman receiving what she was longing for was the listening ear of Jesus. It's in that moment that she received what she wanted. I wonder if you could sit in the curb with Jesus today and if you could pour out your heart to him and tell him the whole story, what would you say? What would you tell him? I used to go to pastor's meetings when I was a, a young pastor and we would have these sharing times, you know, and, and one by one the pastors would go around the circle and they would, they would I used to call them their glory stories, you know. Oh, the Lord's been so good, you know. I baptized 15 people, you know, last Sabbath, and, and, and uh, the church is growing, and tithe is up, and praise God for what he's doing. And I used to look at my own life and think, well, that didn't happen to me. <laughs> you know? uh, I, I'm, I'm struggling to get a couple baptisms. I did an evangelistic meeting last year, and, and only my church members showed up. And, you know, you go through all the, I, that, that isn't me. And then you start to wonder if, you, uh, if you're really cut out for, for being a pastor. Those are my early years of, of ministry. And, and then I began to watch what was really going on. I began to discover that the pastors that told the biggest stories were the ones with the biggest hurts, almost without fail. Um, I... I, I grew up and in my early ministry thought that being a leader meant you, you had great stories and great victories and you were in demand and you traveled all over and went in speaking at different churches and everyone loved you and, and that was leadership. That was what it meant to be a great servant of God. I've come to discover that it's something very different. Um, I've experienced some of these. I've seen it in others. Fear, conflict, loneliness, uncertainty. Anxiety, depression, scarcity, that, that idea that I'm not enough, I don't have enough, I just, if I could only have more. Resignation, uh, I just want to give up sometimes, you know. And being overwhelmed. Which one of us hasn't felt at least a few of those on that list? And, and, and we want to think that, well, if I'm feeling that, then, I, then maybe I'm not the leader that God wants me to be. Maybe. Maybe there's something wrong with me. I've, I've come to realize that that's not the case. I want you to look at one more Bible character, Hosea. One of my good friends, Wesley Brainerd. Uh, he's a mime. I, I've, I've used him several times for, for youth events. And Wesley does a, a short mime piece on the story of Hosea. He does it with music and narration and then mimes the story. Um, and I love the way he brings the story to life. He describes Hosea coming to God one day. And he looks up at God and says, how are you doing today? And God says, not well. Have you seen my people Israel? And they turn their back on me. They're unfaithful to me. And Hosea says, yeah, I know how you feel. And God says, no, you don't. He says, I know how you feel. I, mean, I see Israel. I see how fake they are. I see how, how much they, they reject you and, and walk away from you and disobey you. I know how you feel. And God says, no, you don't know how I feel. And Hosea pauses and he, he looks at the ground and he, he scuffs his feet a bit. And then he looks back up at God as an idea strikes him. And he says, but I want to know how you feel. God says, do you, do you really want to know? Yes, he says. 
then go marry Gomer. And, and this idea bursts in Hosea's mind. He says, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go marry Gomer. I'm going to love her. I'm going to give her everything I can. It's going to be great. And it was great for a while. As he, he loved his, his wife and poured everything into her. But then the bottom fell out. Gomer was unfaithful. Everything collapsed around him. And Hosea in that moment felt a pain that only God could understand. And so God comes to Hosea. He says, how are you doing? Hosea says, not well. And God says, I know how you feel. And Wesley Brainerd ends with this line. He says, a God and a man weep together. And in that moment, Hosea knows God better than anyone else in his world because he has shouldered the brokenness of God. It's a whole different picture of leadership. It's a whole different picture of what suffering is. Suffering is an invitation into intimacy with God. Don't imagine that God doesn't know what suffering is. Every day he wakes up, does God wake up? Probably not. But every day he gets up and he looks at the world and he, he suffers as he sees the brokenness and hurt and pain of his children. Every day he bears that. And we are invited. In fact, throughout the New Testament you hear this idea of, of sharing in the suffering of Christ. Participating in the sufferings of Christ. We are invited to, to take the burden of God onto our shoulders. And suffer with him. And there can be no greater form of leadership than walking in the sufferings of Christ. Those aren't easy things to, to bear. Those aren't the, the nice, neat packages that I can pray and God will take it all away and I'll live my life with joy and peace. Sometimes God invites us to know him deeply know him intimately and he invites us to walk in his sufferings but we never walk alone as God sits in the curb and he says how are you doing not well and he says I know how you feel and in that moment God listens to our whole story and we hear his story and we share it together and we walk in intimacy with him I uh, this summer <laughs> this past summer was a really interesting summer at camp. Not having had camp in 2020 through all the pandemic, and, and we've all heard stories of, of the impact that the isolation and, and, and all of the, the distancing had on children. We kind of prepared for it, but nothing truly prepared us for what we saw. The level of, of dysfunction, the level of brokenness, the level of, of, of pain uh, was, was so intense that it, it placed a huge burden on our, our counselors, many of whom were, were young and first time doing such a thing, and, and they had a cabin full of kids that were just struggling. Um, ministry was hard last summer. Uh, it was painful at times. And so when we came to the end of the summer, I, I thought we can't just, you know, close out the summer and say, great job, everybody. Good job, and look at all the things we did, and, and rah, rah, and out we go. We have to acknowledge what we've just been through. We have to acknowledge the, the, the level of pain and, and brokenness that we all felt. And so we had one final Sabbath together, just with our staff. And we took that day to process what we lost during the summer, uh, what, we, what, what was broken this summer, uh, where were the disappointments this summer? Where were the victories this summer? And in that station where they talked about their victories, we invited them to write how God came and, and, and worked with them throughout the summer. And they put their, their, their writings up on, on a, a wall for everyone to see. 
And at the end of the, of the exercise, I took them all down. I, I read them. And I found this letter from a staff member. Didn't put her name to it. I think I knew who it was. I'm calling her, I'm calling her a she. Uh, this is such a great description of what it means to, to lead and to serve with brokenness. Listen to what she says. Oh, friend, what a summer it has been. One of tears and lostness and the depths of lonesomeness, but one of miracles and miracles and miracles after miracles. God set me here. He dumped me in a heaving mess and let me watch him work in every camper, in every staff, in every one of a thousand emergencies. He worked and he somehow used me. This great mess this glorious series of catastrophes has been the greatest honor of my life. Oh, how one can be used. And what a joy to be taken and used and used again and know somehow I am needed. That this foolish member in the body of God could be used for a camper's healing, for a camper's prayer, for a, a rung bell. And then that, that's a, a reference to every time someone gives their life to Christ, they ring a bell. For a rung bell or a held hand, that is miracle enough. And yet there's more. To lie under the stars as a boy gives his heart to his heart for the first time. To hold a girl as she needs you, specifically to speak to the unspeakable because he gave you words. That was this mess of two months. How great and awesome he is. Did your life ever feel like a great, grand, glorious mess? <laughs> Maybe that's right where God wants you to be. Maybe he's inviting you to walk with him in your brokenness, to be used by him, to make a difference, uh, to allow his glory to shine through you. I titled this, uh, this sermon a, a leadership conversation. Uh, we haven't had much of a conversation so far. Uh, it's been more of a, a one-way street. But I want this time to be an invitation into conversation. Um, we all carry stories. We all harbor brokenness. And we have the privilege uh, to be empathetic listeners, to be the hands and feet and ears of Jesus, to sit on the curb with someone and allow them to tell their whole story. It's not, it's not just Jesus that, that does that. He invites us to do it as well. One of the beauties of the body of Christ is the ability to sit and listen to one another, to hear what life is really like, you know, to, to let someone come up to you and say, do you want to know what my life is really like? Can I tell you who I really am and know that you're going to love me still and that you're going to wrap your arms around me and, 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 and surround me in, with the body of Christ? That's the privilege we have of being the body. And so I hope today that the conversation is just starting and that you learn to listen to people's stories. Um, I gave this message several months ago at a camp convention. There were Adventist camp professionals from all over the country. And we sat down afterwards and we were talking with those that were there and praying with each other. And one man spoke up and said, you know, so I've been doing camp ministry for over 30 years. And I realized today that I've been alone the whole time. What a bro... What, what, what an admission. What, what a, a sense of brokenness. Um, but if that's you, you're looking at your life, I've been alone. I, I, I'm like that woman. Um, I, I pray that God will come near to you today. That he will be there to allow you to share a story. But even more, my prayer for you is to find someone within this body that you can sit with. Um, and for the rest of you who, who may not be in those situations, look for those who need that listening ear. 
Don't allow someone to to sit in these pews week after week, month after month, year after year, and say, I went to the Eden Clause Seventh-day Adventist Church for 30 years, and I realize I've been alone the whole time. Don't allow that to happen. Allow the conversation to continue. And what a great, grand, glorious mess it will be as we shoulder the burden of Jesus, and we hear the pain and the sorrows of others, and we lift each other up, and we lead through our brokenness. Um, today, as we uh, prepare to sing our, our, our closing hymn, I, I want to remind you about that card in the pew. And, and some of you who are shouldering a lot of brokenness and pain in your life, that card is, is an invitation for you into conversation. Um, and you can, you can let your pastoral team and your elders know, I need to sit in the curb with someone. I need to have a conversation. And so today, if, if that's you, don't, don't hesitate to ask to talk with someone, to ask for that conversation. So we're going to sing together as we take up the offering. And once the deacons get through, we'll, we'll stand together and keep singing. Let's pray for the offering. Lord Jesus, as this offering is taken, we ask a blessing on it. We ask that you will use our meager resources to make a difference in this church. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. <clears throat> I come, I confess, bowing here I find my rest. Without you I fall apart, you're the sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are Lord I am free holiness is Christ in Jesus, that is the prayer of our heart today. We need you. Uh, we need to know that, that you're walking by our side, that you're willing to sit in the curb with us and, and, and hear the sorrow and pain of our life. 
Lord, if I could add just one more uh, phrase to that song. We need each other. And Lord Jesus, I pray that the presence of Christ will draw us together as one body, that our stories will, will not be hidden from each other, but that we will bear each other's burdens and uh, suffer with those who suffer, celebrate with those who celebrate, and truly lift each other up. So thanks, Jesus, for what you have created here in this congregation and how um, together, leading through our pain and leading through our brokenness, we can show the world what it means to be your child. In your name we pray. Amen.